Now we're good to go. All right, let's start the lecture. All right, so this lecture is about incident response. We've been talking this whole semester about offense, 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 for the most part, for the sake of vulnerability assessment and penetration testing. The reason I structure it this way is that if you're a defender and you know a great deal about how attackers think, work, and how things are done, you're way better at defending because you can you know what to look for in a more efficient manner. Um, and many of these skills that we've been using, such as re reverse engineering and looking for flaws and things, actually help when looking for uh, attackers. <clears throat> so. Before we talk about incident response, we need to discuss like what is an incident. Um, an incident is really a vague term that in general refers to a security breach or attack. Um, it could be a DOS, like we're seeing uh, being talked about with Spam House right now. Uh, it could be perhaps data leaks. Maybe you just see all your documents on WikiLeaks and you're wondering how the hell that happened. Maybe sabotage, maybe all your tables have been dropped. Uh, <clears throat> Or it could be malware hitting your uh, your employees. So incident response is basically an organized approach to addressing these issues and remediating the aftermath of uh, these incidents. The goals are really to limit the damage of the incident, to limit the recovery time for the organization or company, and to limit the costs incurred by the incident. So when responding to an incident, you may have to hire consultants that are subject matter experts in a particular thing. It's unlikely for your budget, you would have someone with like 30, 15 to 30 years of database experience and a number of other things that would be relevant to this particular incident or attack that's going on. Um, most companies don't equate incident response with profit, so they don't allocate <laughs> budgets that size. So you won't have someone full-time working with that experience. So you have to hire consultants for the length, for the time period of the incident to be able to effectively respond. So thus the common challenge is when dealing with the incident in the real world really comes down to budgets, who you can hire and what you can get done, and the resources that you currently have, and often also limited personnel. Um, I'm gonna talk about that in a second. But also, uh, perhaps intuitively, also the bureaucracy of the organization you, you're currently working in, as well as the share of stakeholders that you have to uh, basically be held account accountable to. So on an incident response team, uh, it's common to have people in these roles. Now, I'm not saying that you should have one person per role, uh, because if that person gets hit by a bus, then you're pretty much screwed. Um, it's best to have basically safety in numbers and have more of a balanced approach in filling this team. So you need, uh, I'll discuss each one. So the team, General roles basically are a coordinator, a manager, the actual responders, subject matter experts, and then someone who can just get anything done um, in the organization, bureaucratically speaking. Um, <clears throat> so a coordinator should be someone who understands the company or organization well, understands all the check boxes and forms and paperwork that you eventually have to fill out at the end of this. Um, also someone who understands the plan of what's going, what, what you set out to do and what you're going to uh, get out from the incident response. <laughs> Manager is someone who has connections and has strong social skills that can deal with people. Um, they have connections, they know the consultants and know how to know who to go to quickly. They know basically the bosses so they can get things done if necessary. And they're able to basically keep impatient people at bay to avoid them, to prevent them slowing down the incident response itself. Um, now incident responders are people like us, uh, technically skilled people who can figure out what's going wrong and to, and are able to uh, fix it and remediate it. Um, subject matter experts are people who have a ton of experience and are generally consultants. Um, and I've already talked about that. And then people who I call basically Zeus, um, who can move any mountain. Usually it's common for this to actually be an executive, someone who might actually be a shareholder, um, someone who has the power to fire people if they're not doing their job. Um, the reason that there's often resistance in dealing with an incident response is that security does not equal profit. 
unless you're in the security business. But for most corporations, if you ask someone to do something security related and they have a deadline that's relevant to the profit of the company, they're more inclined to put that aside and do their primary objective, basically make money for the company. So the keys to effective incident response, first and foremost, come down to clear leadership. Um, there has to be a clear division of responsibilities and authorities. Um, you have to have an established plan. Um, so there's a number of different flow charts and diagrams out there to describe incident response. And the first step is always establish a plan or revise the plan. It always loops back to that after every incident response, basically. After you figure out everything, uh, after you figure out everything, dealt with everything, fix all the, everything, beat back the attackers, compile the report, then you learn from your mistakes and revise the plan. And it's a circular repeating process. So you have to have this basically established plan and well-defined process to basically keep this a streamlined uh, uh, event. Um, and as with almost <laughs> everything security, there's always going to be mistakes. And mistakes shouldn't be hidden or swept under the rug. Um, they're important to be recorded and so they can be learned from later. Um, and so a good leader and incident response team reminds people of this and also keeps morale up. Um, and the last and perhaps most important thing is basically that the leader of uh, the incident response team has to address these ex expectations from the executives, from the bosses. The bosses look at computer security like a whole different field. They don't see it like us. They think it's easy and they expect it to be done by perhaps the end of the week or the end of the day. Um, so someone has to address their perhaps unrealistic expectations and keep them informed as needed, basically on a need to know basis. Um, another key uh, that stands on its own is that uh, incident responders, basically technical personnel uh, that are capable of asking good questions and that actually do this. Um, if you just sit there and don't ask a question and you think of it, it's not going to help. Um, also, it is, it is essential that the plan for your incident response uh, process is not public. If it's public, as an attacker, I know what you're perhaps looking for, if it's detailed enough. Many incident response plans are actually hundreds of pages, perhaps 50 to 100 pages or, if, or more. Um, and they go into immense detail on basically what tools you're going to use, what they're going to do, perhaps who they're going to hire. Uh, and so if an attacker knows this, they know how you're going to react when you think you get attacked. So they can, so they can act accordingly to avoid perhaps your detection. And so like I said, dealing with the stakeholders effectively, this is basically what the executives think, these pictures at the bottom right. You're actually looking for the word virus on a line, you know, a monitor of code or apparently scrambled text. Um, so they won't understand the situation, and they can often make things worse. And they can often slow things down by constantly harassing and checking on the team. Um, and almost always, like I've said a couple times, it does not equal profit to them as far as they see. So nuances to effective incident response involve basically record keeping. Uh, that also makes uh, for record keeping of mistakes. There's going to be lots of 4 a.m. decisions, and you have to have a lot of coffee on hand. Um, and often, also, things get complicated when law enforcement gets involved. If you have any compromise of person identifiable information or uh, legally protected data, such as HIPAA data, FERPA data, financial data, um, it's often common for the FBI, cyber crime unit, to get involved. And in which case, a chain of custody on evidence gets established. And if you touch perhaps a machine that is a, something that's been specified as evidence, you can face criminal charges for tampering with evidence, even though you're just doing your job. So this is a nuance that many people who are just getting started aren't aware of. And people do go to jail over this and lose their job and get fired. And it's stupid. But it's there for a reason. So um, when doing incident response, keeping all your notes, keeping track of all the information you've learned, if you do it on a wiki, make sure it's an internal wiki that's only hosted on the company's network. 
At no point should these documents that are being generated ever be touch, ever touch an outside network. Often incidents are dealing with attackers who are going after sensitive information that shouldn't be exposed outside of your company in the first place. So keeping information on how this information was attacked in the first place should also not be outside of your network in the first place. So Google Docs is absolutely off limits and stuff like that. Um, furthermore, it could also be an incident involving an insider threat. So do not discuss basically with employees and only keep people informed on a need to know basis. Someone may get fired over this incident, someone may get demoted, or someone may even go to jail over this incident. Um, so a lot of the information involved in incident response is actually sensitive information itself. Um, personally identifiable information. Okay. So I said there's this flow chart that many organizations establish. It always has these uh, five or four phases, and they're not all on this slide. The zeroth one is really preparation. You have to have a plan for, for, for how to react to an incident, how to respond to an incident, in order to even do an incident response effectively. You have to have a plan established and a team established. And doing that itself, you could probably find dozens of consultants to just advise on that task alone. Uh, and that's outside the scope of this lecture, and I don't know enough about it. Um, but essentially, Incident response phases come down to triage, containment, response, and resolution. And it's a cyclic, uh, a cyclic uh, basically, uh, uh, process. So triage, the, the word triage basically comes from battlefield medicine. Identify who's as good as dead, who's dying, and who's savable, and act accordingly. That's, in essence, what triage is about. And it's kind of hand in hand with containment. They're almost amorphous and indistinguishable at times. Um, containment is basically scramble to understand the problem and communicate quickly what is known while trying to basically uh, get to a point where the incident is no longer a direct threat to the organization. So you want to basically limit the scope of the incident basically separate you know, the, the healthy and uninfected from the infected, basically establish a quarantine, um, and then stop the bleeding infection. So at this point, since you're sharing information, it's also wise to, as soon as possible, share information with the stakeholders and address their expectations as to what exactly is going on. In the third phase, generally is titled response and it's pretty straightforward, you fix the problems. Um, afterwards, resolution involves generating uh, a root cause analysis, how this happened and why, what are the root causes. Um, and they, they may be some things that are deep-seated and outside the scope and ability of the incident response team itself. Um, they may be things that are deep-seated in the organization's business logic that require executives to actually debate over. Um, or maybe something that's political. Uh, we have this feature because Bob, the chairman, really, really, really wanted it and it just so happened it's horribly vulnerable. Um, it may also be a legacy system that a past executive spent $10 million on. We just are not going to fix it because we can't justify that accounting-wise. Um, and you often see that similar logic be used uh, if you uh, hear any pen testing stories People always complain about, you just have to accept that people aren't going to fix some systems, especially legacy systems, because they're, no, they just won't hear it. Um, and so at, in the resolution, back to the lecture, um, you generate an incident response report, basically according to your plan. Your plan should basically explain what you're going to present in your report. Um, and then you deal with the aftermath. Someone may get fired, demoted, or go to jail. and Usually few details are actually ever disclosed. Like I said, the targets are usually sensitive information and the details there are how the sensitive information was stolen or leaked. And those details are sensitive, all of that. And so few details about that whole incident will ever really get leaked <laughs> uh, or even disclosed to the public. 
And plus, it's bad PR. <laughs> Most people see us. So what is an what distinguishes basically something from an incident to something that I, you should just tell IT about and let it get hammered out by the end of the week? Um, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, if anyone's seen the IT crowd, uh, he's in the basement in the server room and there's a fire started. He's like, well, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to submit a ticket. <laughs> um, so this, this is a heuristic-driven decision. And with all heuristics, there's no silver bullet. Um, there's going to be no perfect way to distinguish every time this is an incident, uh, and we need to respond as soon as possible, as opposed to this is something IT can worry about. Um, because launching an incident response team can basically trigger this expenditure of a lot of money on the incident response budget, namely hiring consultants if necessary and whatnot. So this leads us to discussing these heuristics, which are called indicators of compromise. And this, this book in the bottom right called Incident Response, I think, sums this up perfectly. Um, it's basically a guy trying to fight off like a great white shark with a pickaxe, and he's using it wrong. Because you're effectively trying to mine for data to indicate whether or not you're being attacked by that shark. And then you can start fighting him back. They should just have had him like face visible, and he's blindfolded as well. Um, because that's, that's a better depiction. Um, so indicator compromise is a, is a forensic artifact or remnant of an intrusion that can be identified on a host or on the network. And these indicators, IOCs, are used to communicate threat intelligence among the defenders and the incident responders. So the nature of the IOCs <laughs> will depend on the attacker, whether it's an insider threat with intimate knowledge of your systems or it's an ins outside hacker or perhaps a hybrid. Um, uh, or perhaps it's just a script kitty. Um, in each of those cases and more, the details will always vary. So it also depends on the attack vector. Maybe it's a Stuxnet style attack with malicious USBs dropped off in your parking lot, or it's something over the network. So here are some straightforward indicators. Basically, anonymous dumps your corporate emails. Or WikiLeaks is talking about you today. Or a financial audit reveals a ton of money is missing um, from the accounting databases. Some not so for straightforward indicators could, which is where it's kind of gray area involved things like you find out from the news perhaps it's a whistleblower. Whistleblowers are protected some, by some laws and they're often anonymous perhaps, but perhaps how difficult would it be to, for some disgruntled employee to whistleblow on something that's non-existent and make fraudulent documents or impersonate a legitimate user with stolen documents and then say, hey, I am this person. Look at my badge. It's a stolen badge. Look at all this information. I want the whistleblow. That's, a, that's something a malicious attacker could do. Um, or perhaps it's a leak of the new plans for your next BlackBerry or next iPhone. Um, that obviously gives your competitors a significant advantage, and it indubitably would be considered by many as an incident that needs to be responded to, whether or not is one that needs technical response, but certainly legal response. And usually incident response teams do have a legal aspect to them, because usually what's happening is a response to a crime. So perhaps leak of mergers or quarterly performance, which could give the market uh, reason to act adversely to your company. Um, <clears throat> but here's some more general technical examples. Database tables are missing, or systems are crashing, or there's strange traffic on the network, or user machines start acting abnormally slow, or there's intrusion detection system alerts. And surely I could go on. Um, but some realistic examples of strong indicators of compromise uh, involve things like combinations of things. like Suspicious meta metadata, metadata in a file combined with some, some packed code, some packed assembly code in that process space. Um, it could be a, a packed module like a DLL that's been injected into that vulnerable process, that victim process. 
or perhaps the creation of a number of suspicious registry keys in the, in the system startup directory, um, and perhaps mutexes. I haven't really talked about mutexes. Maybe I'll talk about that next time. So there's standards that have been established by basically the Open Indicator of Compromise uh, Initiative. Um, and uh, they are used to basically effectively communicate in a standardized way indicators of compromise. It's pretty straightforward. And they're defined here in this RFC that's been around since, I think, uh, <coughs> early 2000s, maybe late 90s. So after identifying the indicators of compromise, basically it comes down to fixing the problem, perhaps fixing the firewall rules, adding malware signatures to detect the problem, and uh, then investigating the full extent of the compromise and the target of the attacker, if there were any. Could be just a worm that's infected your systems as well. Um, so at the end of the day, or rather it should be like at the end of the process because it could take weeks, um, the damage is contained and stopped identifiably so. Um, the attacker's uh, attack vector is hopefully identified, but at least it's stopped. Um, those two sometimes are exclusive. Um, and then in the incident response report, you detail the impact of the breach, the scope of the attack and the damage done, um, the details of the breach, any technical details that are relevant, how you address the, the, the incident. Specifically, you have to address how you spent the incident response budget. Um, technical steps that are taken, indicators of compromise that are identified, and how it was fixed and steps to take in the future. Perhaps you recommend more penetration testing. But at the end of the day, the company needs to be basically reminded of its risks. Perhaps its risk model needs to be uh, needs to be reviewed and perhaps updated. And we see a lot of companies operating with the see no evil, see no evil, see no evil risk model. So let's talk about the toolkit um, and get to technical stuff. So if you happen to have a ton of money, you might be able to afford something like NCASE, which is $25,000 or so per CD key. Um, Hopefully there's an intrusion protection system on the network, could use Snort perhaps. Uh, something like the Sleuth Kit and Volatility and the Sys Internal Suite uh, are all free tools that are essential for essentially uh, hard disk and memory forensics, um, as well as basically process analysis and Windows internals analysis. Ida Pro, although a free version item might do the trick, um, and then your debugger of choice. And this isn't even a comprehensive list. So uh, since this talk is mainly supposed to be about volatility, let's get to it. Um, volatility is a framework for extracting digital artifacts from RAM, from essentially volatile memory. As we've seen, Meterpreter as a payload with the Metasploit framework leaves no forensic evidence on disk. So hard disk forensics would offered no clues as to what an attacker did on a system. You would have to take a virtual memory snapshot at during the period of compromise where the attacker perhaps is present on a system. If he's using something like Metasploit, it wouldn't be uncommon for the attacker to pop a shell, deal, and perhaps pop a shell on a number of systems and deal with them one at a time, but leave those sessions running in the background. Those sessions would be active. You would be able to Perhaps, depending on how long the attacker is working on your network, be it an hour, two hours, maybe a day, uh, you would have a perhaps a, 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 a time window that you could take the, the, a snapshot. Um, usually with a good enough team, you have a sufficient amount of uh, situational awareness that you can respond in such a manner in the time frame of hours or so, usually minutes if the team's good. So volatility has two interfaces. There's a single command, command line binary that's, in my opinion, pretty freaking inefficient. But volatility is a great tool. It takes in a memory dump of the entire process, the entire memory state of a machine. 
as input along with one command. And then it runs, runs that one command on that memory dump and then it gets your results. And if you want to do a different command, you have to do it all over again. So it's not something you load the memory dump up front and then run all these different commands in an efficient way. No. You have to load it each time, which is why today's demo is not going to be on the spot because it takes some time. It usually takes a minute or two to actually do a, a scan. So <clears throat> it is entirely uh, supporting of uh, Windows family uh, from XP to 7, 32-bit and 64-bit, although the, the details on which service packs it supports can vary. Um, and the other interface it has is uh, something I'm not too familiar with, the interactive vol shell. Um, it is actually interactive. It's built off of a, uh, <clears throat> a Python interpreter command shell. So you can leverage the entire power of Python there. So, but before we look at all the, before we start working with volatility, we need to familiar ourselves with the different plugins or options or commands we can run. So all the commands for volatility are essentially plugins to the framework. Um, so the basic usage is essentially you run it, hyphen F, and then after that is the memory dump file you want to analyze. Um, you can give it a profile that's optional. That will speed up uh, its uh, scanning. Um, essentially, the profile of the system memory can differ between Windows XP 32-bit and 64-bit, and between the versions, and I'm sure you can see why. Things are done just a little bit differently here and there. So the parsing of these memory structures Will necessarily have to differ. So, uh, in general, if you uh, need the list of commands currently available in your version of volatility, you just do hyphen H or dash dash help. Um, and then for plugin specific help, you give it the plugin and then help. There we go. So, um, there's some generic commands like image info, which gives you the general info of the memory dump. Perhaps you just get a random memory dump. You don't know what operating system, uh, what version of Windows it is. This will tell you the potential profiles that the memory dump will fit according to its heuristics. Um, but actually diving into what's in the memory info, one of the most basic commands is PSList. And I'll tell you all the active processes running in memory at that time which is really great for getting started. You can see everything that was running in the, in the system space. So in order to basically have an effective memory dump, you have to be running an essentially administrator privilege on a Windows system to take a snapshot of memory in order to get all that information. Because there's things like system and other things that may not be available or visible to, that user, to other users. <clears throat> there's other uh, useful tools like PS3. PS3 is a... Uh, it's a common uh, command on Linux systems that shows you basically in a parent-child oriented tree exactly what processes are, what was spawned by what. It's very useful. Um, so you can see perhaps if an attacker compromised the process, what he spawned after that, uh, he or she. Um, another useful tool uh, is Malfind. Um, and that will find injected code blocks. So a common, uh, common tactic by malware and both attackers is to utilize something that uh, is built off injecting DLLs into a process, a vulnerable process, to expand capabilities for the attacker, perhaps to have an interpreter payload executed. So <clears throat> that won't find all the injected, all the ways you can inject code into a process. Um, there are some means for injecting uh, code into a process that this won't find, and modules like uh, LDR modules, or plugins like LDR modules and Imscan can help find those, but essentially DLL lists will find all code blocks for the most part.
So get SIDs, if it's present, will display all the, the user tokens. And that's very useful um, to see exactly what has what. If you happen to see calculator running at system token, something may be up. <laughs> so uh, like I said, PS list threads is also useful to look at. Um, Windows is a multi-threaded operating system, and each process has at least one thread. Um, so that's a more detailed way to analyze things. <clears throat> so then we have proc exec dump and proc mem dump. Um, and these will effectively dump an image of a process in memory for further analysis. And uh, mal dump effectively works the same way. Um, I think it leverages those. And it finds those injected code blocks and then dumps the image process containing them. So you can open them up in IDA or Ollie Debug or whatever you prefer. Um, you can look at the event logs. If they've been completely cleared, you know maybe the attacker has perhaps tried to clear them. Because normal event logs are, have entries populated in them. You can, if Internet Explorer is open, you can look at the history of the user uh, browsing the network. Um, obviously, you could write a plugin for Chrome and Firefox as necessary. Um, but what this lets you see is perhaps the user was viewing some shady sites, and that may be an indicator as to perhaps the attack vector. Maybe he was watching porn at work on some underground site, and there was malware on there. Um, it's actually not uncommon, unfortunately. There's a number of studies out there show that like ridiculous percentage of people do that. It's ugh. So <clears throat> the next important thing to talk about is looking at the active network information going on in a memory uh, snapshot. Um, this uh, list of plugins depends on uh, what version of Windows you're looking at, whether it's XP or 2003 or Vista 2008 or 7. Because the handling for the uh, memory structures here drastically different. So connection sockets, conscan, and sock scan are for XP 2003. And then just net scan itself will handle the rest. Um, so this will find basically source destination uh, connections along with what ports are communicating over. And it does take a while to run depending on uh, the, the case. Now, there's, there's plugins for analyzing kernel memory. Um, and you can look for modules that have perhaps been loaded into the kernel. Uh, perhaps someone's attempting to make a rootkit at this stage. Um, however, if they have, you should all be aware by now that if someone has uh, um, has established rootkit capabilities at this point, they can hook the uh, the API calls for the operating system to you know to inspect kernel space. However, they can't hide from this. If they have rootkit code running in RAM, an entire dump of RAM will reveal this. However, if you use a program inside the victim machine, like Moon Souls and it uses all those standard API calls to do that dump of RAM, it can evade that dump. So if you suspect a root is possible, you need to make sure the way you dump the system, the state of that system's memory, is not something that can be subverted by the attacker. So. Um, and then there's other things for kernel objects, for drivers. Uh, there's things for analyzing the registry. Uh, very useful. Um, you can list all the registry highs and you can print out keys. Uh, <clears throat> and then there's information for volatility shell. You can also dump the, the passwords of a system. Perhaps a user uh, has forgotten his password, and you really have to recover it for whatever reason. If you can log on as an administrator on that machine, uh, you can dump the password information this way. It may just be a hash that you're able to access, but you can then crack it. 
Like perhaps it's used to log into the legacy systems and you can't afford to touch that. As in they reuse the password. Um, then uh, you can analyze file system aspects, at least the ones that are loaded into memory with volatility. Um, for instance, the master boot record will be in memory, um, as well as the main file table. Um, and then anything that's cached, you can dump as well. So there was a, a CTF uh, last December, more, more or less a CTF, in which we were given a, a memory snapshot of a system that was used as a development box to build this custom coffee pod that had network access. And our goal was just from the memory snapshot, figure out how to hack the coffee pot and make it brew us coffee. So I was able to effectively find the processes that are running, find a text editor, dump the state of the text editor. It didn't give me enough, so I dumped the files that were cached for the text editor. And one of them was an old closed file that include, included basically username and password information for the portal to the coffee pot. And I was able to use that to basically get into the coffee pot and make it brew me coffee, which actually tasted terrible. Such as the, I guess, I guess that's what victory tastes like. But so um, there's other things for basically analyzing the clipboard, uh, any event hooks, perhaps. Um, maybe there's event hooks going on to on new window, pop this other window for this ad that adware or spyware is perhaps using uh, that you might be able to find that way if spy if spybot or uh, other uh, tools aren't finding it. So we've covered enough of that. Um, now I would do the rest of this on demand. I'm trying to reach Google. You better reach it. Okay, good. All right. So I already talked a little about, about getting memory dump um, and the, the challenges perhaps when investigating roof kits. Um, so I typically, when not worrying about rootkits, use Moonsoul's memory dump tools. Um, pull this up for a second. So this is a free toolkit. Um, it comes with some useful tools, but I really only use two of them, uh, Win32DD and Win64DD. These effectively emulate the Linux tool DD. Uh, DD is a forensics tool used for scraping everything from sector zero to the last sector on a hard disk uh, in a forensically uh, court admissible way. Um, so for RAM, it effectively does the same. And so that's how I get my memory uh, snapshots. It's a pretty good tool. And so if you can read it, I hope so, in the back. It, on the Windows uh, man line, um, you just type win32db, type in b to tell it to dump, and then the slash f and what follows tells it where what file to dump and where. And so it gives you basically a yes no prompt at the end to make sure you have enough hard disk space to dump all this, because it may be several gigs, um, and then you proceed as follows. And so after it's done basically gives you a report. So using a, a, a memory dump with volatility, we can analyze the process list, the thread list, um, each process memory on an individual basis. You can actually disassemble things within a process, um, although I prefer to just dump it and then look at it in my debugger of choice. You can look at the active connection sockets, DLLs. You can find malware and backdoors in memory, like I said, which may leave zero forensic evidence on disk. Um, and if you are stuck using volatility, hyphen H is for help, and that refers also to modules, and hyphen V is for verbose. And hyphen V is great because if you will go to the next slide, there's some nuances with using volatility. It silently fails if you like mistype a command or give it a bad option or give it a plugin for something on like that cheat sheet that actually your installation didn't really come with. It will just silently fail if you don't tell it to, uh, uh, to act verbosely. Um, and another little nuance is all of these plugins are mostly community written. So they can fail in weird ways and your mileage may vary 
They won't always work. They won't work for all versions of Windows. They may not work for IPv6. Um, and so another little nuance is if you do something like malfind or proc mem dump on uh, a system and you have antivirus running on that system, it can often actually dump a PE file. And your antivirus will say, hey, whoa, quarantine, found this Trojan. That may be a good indicator, but that could, you know, if you don't see that tiny little window in the bottom right, you may miss it. So it's usually wise to turn off this stuff because you're not going to be executing the malware anyways. You're going to be loading it a debugger, IDA Pro, or whatnot. So dumping processes from a VMEM dump can trigger antivirus or host-based intrusion detection systems. So I would demo this if it didn't take forever. Um, so at home, this is a scenario that I basically ran. Uh, through a vector I'm not going to tell yet, uh, I exploited a victim, a Windows XP machine, and spawned an interpreter payload. I ran get system, then I spawned calculator.exe, then I migrated to calculator.exe. I could have migrated to explorer.exe to be more subtle, but this is just for the sake of demonstration. Then, it basically, a little bit after that point, I took a snapshot of the memory. And then this is where we're proceeding. So <clears throat> given the snapshot, an easy, quick way to get started is to start off just with malfind. If malfind turns up results, it will dump the, uh, if you tell it to, it will dump all the process images for any of the suspicious results. And you can be analyzing them there. Uh, it won't name each process. Like this is calc.exe. It will say this is basically, it won't even say this is PID this. Um, when you run uh, PS list, it will tell you the PID, the address it's running at, and the size of the image. When it, when malfind and proc map dump of these things dump these images, they address them by the address they start at and the size. And you have to basically go back to the process list and match this up. So Malfine finds things based off VAD tag and page permissions, and it can't detect DLLs injected into a process using create remote thread, you know, load this DLL. Um, it's still very helpful, but like I said, it's not a silver bullet. So other things I've mentioned are IDR modules, DLL list, and MScan. So Malfine is actually uh, commonly used by incident responders, and here's an example of it using to find uh, Zeus-related malware. And Zeus is basically a crime kit that you can buy for I don't know how much money on the bike, on the underground, but it is pretty common. Um, <clears throat> so you can specify for mal for Malfine exactly what process to look at, and it'll tell you the relevant basically modules. So here, um, Zeus happened to infect basically by injecting a DLL into Explorer.exe. Um, so, what I've prepared basically to demonstrate is how you would use volatility and these tools that we've shown so far through the class, how to do triage and containment, how to do response, basically resolution. <coughs> so, hopefully I can do this in 20 minutes. Um, if the first thing you do is malfind, it may take a couple minutes, and it will dump basically on the console uh, all the relevant information. So to tell it to dump to basically a file, you give it hyphen capital D, and you tell it what directory to do. And so it dumps all the process images here. So some are just raw binary data, and if you try to open them up in like IDA, it's going to have no PE headers. It's just going to be raw binary data. And you may face like alignment issues with decoding the opcodes right. So you need to find basically the process entry point and be able to start from there. And that's a pain. However, many times it will actually dump a valid PE with PE headers. Some of this, some of the tables may be stripped, like the IAT tables. Um, so <clears throat> going through those and opening them up one by one. You can quickly, with something like IDA, figure out, okay, what's suspicious, what's not. Um, and 
from also the console output, you can generally correspond what process is what. Um, so at the end of iterating through this, I found something actually really, really interesting, and it happened to be in calc.exe. I found these strings called priv underscore password underscore get sam hashes and priv elevate get system. Why would calculator or any program actually need those two strings? So I did some more investigation. They're stored in the R data, so not stored actually in the dot text or anything like that. Um, so, and we have all these other strings stored in the R data. <clears throat> and at the it, it, Almost right away, that should tell you something's going on. There's, it's just either a malicious version of calc.exe or it's a compromised version of calc.exe. And since I happen to be familiar with Meterpreter, I know this command called get system. And so that's a pretty dead giveaway. Um, so this is a strong indicator of compromise. This is not something that should normally be in calculator.exe. Even if I were to be uh, mean and put this in explorer.exe for the sake of example, why would explorer.exc need get system or get sam hashes? Um, even get sam hashes seems totally relevant. Maybe in some weird implementation of explorer.exc, it needs system access to do something. Um, but that's why the, the NTDLL and Win32 API exists. So that to handle sensitive kernel level functions, you pass it through this user land API that passes along to the Win32 API that runs at system level, at kernel level. So to bypass that seems completely against the entire design principles of Microsoft's operating system. So that in itself, if you, if you happen to understand that, it's one of the first things that I taught, you would probably, get, you'd probably recognize, hey, this is, this is wrong. This shouldn't exist. Um, and it just so happens that there's no actually API call to call this. So what this turns out to be, um, is, uh, so since we study Meterpreter, the first thing Meterpreter does is it loads, basically, once the established core starts injecting DLLs on the client side to establish uh, the functionality. It does everything through reflective DLL injection. And so the first DLL it loads is its standard API. And in that standard API are commands like get system and get same hashes. So even the, and it loads that standard API 100% of the time. Uh, it may not load anything else, but that itself is a, is a sufficient uh, indicator that, hey, uh, something's going wrong. This is actually probably my interpreter session. Um, so this is not just malware. So, uh, I discussed this with some of my friends, and um, well, let's get to the slide. Given these two strings, you can write a signature to detect this running in memory. However, you have to have the ability to basically scan the entire process image, uh, which is time intensive. But AVs do do this, and host-based intrusion detection systems do this, and perhaps a custom rat. Does everyone know what a rat is? I haven't talked about it. No one. Good. Okay. It stands for Remote Administration Tool. It's just co something common with system administration. I'm not going to really test on it. Um, so rats are basically something used by system administrators to poke around in the system that they've just customly written. Um, or perhaps it's an open source one. Uh, so to demonstrate that you can write a signature for this, there's a, a, a rule language called Yara, and it's based off J, generally C structs. And so I have an example Yara rule below that will detect Meterpreter in memory. You could use this on a, a host-based intrusion detection system, and it will detect any active Meterpreter sessions as long as it manages to scan it. So let's talk about Meterpreter. Say you have an exploit, you send it over the wire, you send it on an open port, the firewall lets it through, you have your pay, you have the packet's payload, basically the application data you're sending is encoded to get past the firewall, the intrusion detection system, to get past the web application firewall. Everyone with me? 
So at the point where it actually uh, hits the vulnerable system and starts executing, perhaps it starts decoding itself to get uh, around the problems of bad bytes and null bytes. And then after the end of that, you probably perhaps have raw opcodes right there. Even if you have further encoding at that point, uh, like Shikata Gai, Gai Nai or something else being active, uh, if that function gets run and decodes itself, at that state it will be decoded in memory. Um, so if you have these strings like this uh, somewhere in that payload, uh, it will be visible at that time. I'm going to talk at the end of that how to, you would improve Meterpreter to basically make this more or less undetectable. So you could write, you could use this uh, rule to detect Meterpreter sessions um, just based off the printable strings in the process image. Um, there's other ways you could do it. You could find specific opcode series uh, to Meterpreter. Uh, say some of the some of the opcodes and one of the main functions in the standard DL, standard API DL, or in the core system itself, and use those to build basically detection rules so that you can act on interpreter events or interpreter related intrusions. So before deploying any uh, new rule to antivirus or intrusion detection system. It's essential that you do some testing first, because these things are heuristics, and statistically, they can encounter false positives and false negatives. Um, so you want to make sure that, hey, this actually detects this. Uh, you could do it through volatility itself. It supports something called Yara scan. So it will scan the memory image you've given it, which is exactly the same as any AV scanning the full memory of a given system for it. Um, for anything that matches these R rules. And you can see it's basically A equals priv escalate get system, B equals priv get same hashes, and the condition is that A and B are both present. It's really straightforward. And so if that rule is matched, Yara scan will return true. This matches. And so that's a good test. And also return any details. This is the PID it matches. Now if it happens to match something else, say instead of naming these things priv escalate get system priv password gets same hashes, they named it something clever. And they still wanted to keep, you know, printable strings. They just wanted to get around this whole problem by naming it something that's common somewhere else. You can see how false positives would come back. Like if they made A B user name and B B password, and that's just their functions to own shit, um, you can see how this would generate false positives, which is why you would perhaps need to go to another route for writing signatures, um, specifically going for matching hexadecimal bytes, um, looking for the specific opcodes. So if all is good, perhaps you establish a whitelist and say smss.exe actually has this also. And so your condition with this be adapted that a and B are present, and it's also not smss.exe. And it would be that simple. Um, so then you would update basically the host and intrusion protection systems across the network with this, or the AV if they're compatible with this rule, and uh, then have it uh, act with uh, the, have it specified to act with kill any matching process that matches this rule. And then all interpreter sessions in the network will hopefully be killed. And it's really that simple sometimes. Um, obviously, uh, it depends on whether or not your systems support uh, Yara rules. Um, so uh, also, side note. So we saw we see priv escalate get system um, and priv escalate get same hashes. These actually don't by themselves indicate the user the attacker has attempted to get system or to steal the same hashes. Um, so you have to do further analysis to actually determine that. Um, so analysis would be like looking at the handles for open files to see anything related to the same hashes, like uh, looking at see if LSAS, perhaps the, the process uh, has an open handle that something is actually scanning through the process memory for LSAS.exe. 
or something is actually has system access and is open SAM, uh, the SAM file itself. There's an open file handle there. And so there's a plugin in Volatility that I think I skipped over called Handles. And it's just like uh, LSOF with Linux. And that's basically LS for all the open file descriptors. So discovering those would obviously require more investigation. Um, so like I said, altern alternate rules for uh, Yara or other signatures uh, usually involve the capability to search for hexadecimal strings along with wildcards. And wildcards could just be a question mark, and they would just be filled in by anything. Um, it's pretty simple, regular expression matching. So there are some things that use Yara. I used it because it's easy to understand, and thus it's easy to teach. Um, so these vendors use it. Volatility also uses it, uh, thanks to a community plugin. Uh, whoever wrote that is awesome. And uh, FireEye and ClamAV, uh, these vendors slash products, are the only ones that I know of that happen to be host-based intrusion detection systems and antivirus. ClamAV is Linux only, as far as I know. And FireEye, you have to pay for it. Um, and they support UR rules. Now, if you had a different intrusion detection system that you could write rules for, obviously you'd have to write it in whichever language is supported. I simply use Yara because it's easy. So <clears throat> we've detected that calc.exe is currently hosting a interpreter section. And we're able to find, just by looking at the strings, which is a lucky find in itself, that there's some suspicious activity going on. Even if we didn't know as an interpreter and didn't have this inside knowledge, we could recognize, if we're careful, that why does calculator have get system and get same hashes? Um, so you could build a Yara rule just off that knowledge, and then you use Yara scan to automate detection of whatever memory dumps you had across the network. Uh, perhaps you're just doing one thing at a time. Once you establish a rule, you can use that rule on all the other memory dumps you have to speed up analysis. Find out what other processes across machines the attacker is potentially compromised at that time. And that is a wonderful way to help you identify the scope of the attack. So in responding to it, we want to identify where the attacker is coming from and identify whether the attacker compromised the system token. If he did, there's a higher chance of him having the ability to establish a rootkit. And that is a pain. <coughs> So, using Volatility's uh, plugin API hooks, it looks through any processes and finds instances where the API uh, has, uh, tables have been hooked. In other words, they've been modified to point to perhaps uh, attacker code that does some stuff and then jumps somewhere else, perhaps back to the original function. Um, and so, the results tell us that SVC hosts has some API hooks in it, that foxitreader.ext has API hooks in it, and Windows Update, basically Windows Auto Update Control has uh, EXE hooks in it. So breaking these down, svchost.exe is something that you'll often find dozens of things running, and dozens, dozen versions of it running at the same time. Um, is also running with system privilege. So if something running a system has API hooks present in it, something had access to edit it. Usually that means something already had uh, a system token access or exploited some vulnerability in SVC host or some unknown vulnerability to obtain that privilege. So <clears throat> that's a strong indicator of compromise for compromise of the system token. Also, the presence of API hooks in Foxit Reader indicate that that perhaps was the initial vector. So this could all possibly be some malicious PDF hitting your network. Um, and Windows, uh, uh, Windows Update Auto Control is a user level process. It may have also been affected. I don't know.
So uh, using ConScan, which on my system took 25 minutes to run. Yeah, this is why I'm not going to do this for you in class. Um, I don't want to put you all asleep. Um, it shows four connections are currently open, but there's only two IP addresses really being used. One is the gateway, and one is 192.168.1.161. I didn't have time to make it some uh, foreign IP address to make this all you know, more realistic. But also, I should note that when dealing with this at a realistic level, you should expect to see this being a really populated table. And, but at least it shows you uh, IP addresses to start with. And you can start doing who is requests and see uh, what's the legitimate service, perhaps 74. whatever. 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 This is Google, um, and so on and so on. And you can identify perhaps Tor exit nodes or proxies. Um, or anonymous VPN services that are being used. Um, then with that information, you can update the firewall to, if you really want to, to perhaps just drop all connections uh, being uh, initiated to or from that IP address. <clears throat> so since we're basically out of time, um, I demonstrated how we use volatility and I to find basically the back door just with malfind. We got a little bit lucky. Um, I didn't show you uh, going through all the process steps with Ida. Um, showed you the compromise process. Uh, we found the attacker's IP, and we have a strong indicator the attack vector was a Fox reader exploit, and also uh, indicator that the system token was compromised from the API hooks. And this was all without using any disk forensic evidence. Um, so I could, someone could realistically have an entire semester long course on this stuff. So, however, hopefully, given all the information on offensive stuff I've presented to you thus far through the semester, you kind of have an ability to pick this up pretty easily and at least be able to follow along with what I've been saying. Um, <coughs> So, yeah, I kind of already talked about Vol Shell. Any questions? Yes. If there's a root kit on the system, will that be, will there be evidence for that on the disk? Uh, probably yes. Um, unless it's a uh, ring negative one or ring negative two root kit. Um, in which case it could infect things like the certain parts of the BIOS. There's been rootkit proof of concepts that write themselves to uh, MacBook batteries. Uh, Charlie Miller, I believe, reverse engineered the whole API with which basically the MacBook figures out how much charge is left on the battery, tells it what time it is, and makes the clock run and keeps the clock synchronized. And it's basically this, this I.O. communication going on with the battery. And there's a, some vulnerabilities and buffer overflows on the battery's firmware. And he basically used that to write his rootkit to the battery. And you have to buy a new battery. And that's the most expensive part of the MacBook. So um, no, rootkits could be beyond the disk. Good question. Any other questions? Questions on the homework? Complaints? Concerns? OK, so I don't have the midterms graded yet. I've been absolutely swamped with uh, employment paperwork uh, regarding various stuff. Um, what can I say? I'm going to have, hopefully, the tests, homework 4, homework 5, all ready to turn back to you next time. As well as I'm going to uh, have an explanation of uh, a better explanation as to you know, what I expect April 11th. Uh, from the term projects, um, what your presentation should be, what the term turn-ins and deliverables should be, um, and uh, talk about deadlines and stuff like that. So um, if you have any questions, concerns about that, this weekend is the time to email me because I'm putting it all together, the plan, so I can take in, into account anyone's considerations, complaints, or uh, Hate mail or whatever. Did you so, say April 11th deadline? I 
believe that's what it's listed. I can't remember off the top of my head. Yep. 